Hello, everybody, and welcome again to one of our summer virtual series. My name is Tara Stevenson. I serve as the Interim Vice President of Student Affairs here at Flagler. And tonight, I am joined by... Hi, I'm Sarah Upchurch. I'm the Director of Advising and Academic Operations, and I'm also a Flagler alum. So a couple of housekeeping things before we jump in is we got a lot of questions from people that joined us last week wanting the, oh, wait a minute before we keep going. We have Kendra here. Kendra, welcome. Hello, hello. Hello, Kendra, real quick, introduce yourself to everybody. Hi, my name is Kendra Terzona. I am a recent grad of Flagler College, and I graduated in May with a degree in coastal environmental science with a minor in biology. And what is the reasoning that you're joining us tonight? So uh, throughout my three years at Flagler, I worked at the case desk, and so I got both the case perspective and the student perspective when it came to registering and making schedules. Yes. Um, and so we wanted to be able to add that extra element tonight of a student perspective. Um, but thank you. Um, so we'll go back to our housekeeping items. Got lots of questions about the recordings for these. And so we are working with our marketing and communications department to see about getting these up into our family portal, getting them out into our incoming student newsletter so that if we have anybody who wanted to rewatch a topic or share it with another student who's uh, wasn't able to join us or another family member that wasn't able to join us those will be coming out shortly um and then at the end of tonight's session we'll go over some of our other upcoming ones for you all don't forget that we have our q a option available and so i'll be monitoring that throughout if we can ask questions throughout we've got some curated ones we'll definitely get those but then at the end we'll have a lot of time for you all to ask questions of our two panelists tonight um, but with that, Sarah, when you and I had our initial discussion, I loved how you said it's kind of like what's behind the curtain, like giving them a view of like what's going on on the back end. And I said, yes, I think so many of our families and students want to know kind of what is happening behind the curtain. And so let's just start with intro, like student is accepted. What happens? Yes. So there's lots and lots of things that happen. And that's kind of what my whole job is. Um, but the way to think about it is for a very long time, the admissions counselor is your student's go-to person. And eventually the admissions counselor has to pivot and start recruiting the next class. So that's where we step in. And the case advisor for your student becomes that new point person. So our primary job is getting your student registered, answering questions about academics and academic resources. However, we can just be the one-stop shop if you don't know where to start. We can direct you to the right office or the right person um, as you kind of transition to Flagler. And so students have transitioned then to K. So what is that beginning process? Like what are those communication pieces? What are those first steps? What does that look like? The very first thing that goes out is a case welcome email. Um, our first year transfer and readmitted students all receive this. Uh, I believe that one also goes to any parents or guardians on file. So I think everybody got that. That's just a little bit about who we are, what our role is. And then it also links to our team page. So you can see all of our photos, emails, phone numbers, uh, who we typically work with. And then our appointment links are on there as well if you wanted to book an appointment. Um, you do not have to be a current student to book an appointment. So even if you've just deposited and you have questions, go ahead and use that. That's what that's for. Um, so that's the very first thing, that welcome email. That same evening, you your student gets a math placement invitation. This is really, really, really important because it is one of the main barriers between a student and their schedule. Um, I think there's really three main parts to getting that schedule, submitting your enrollment deposit, submitting your enrollment forms, those are both through admissions, and then submitting your math placement survey and or exam. Um, I say and or because the survey is only required, um, you know, you're only going to do the survey if you've already taken college level math. If you've never taken college level math, you will fill out a survey and complete the exam. 
So everybody does that. I don't care if you have a whole bachelor's degree. We at least need the survey so that we have some background information on your math because that is so personal and unique to each student. We want to just make sure we're putting you in the appropriate math, not only for your skill level, but also for your program. This is a good time for maybe like a little snack break. Kendra, I think you're interested in it. We, we, I'm, I'm one of those, we just got to talk about it. <laughs> we love webinars. We love the virtual world. <laughs> Kendra, did you do the math placement when you were coming in as an incoming student? So I came in as a transfer student. So, and I came in with college level courses in math. So whenever I was supposed to take the math placement, it just analyzed what I was coming in with as my college courses. Okay, so good point. There's a little bit different for our transfer students coming yeah. in. Um, and that's whether they come in with that college level class that they took while in high school or whether they're coming from another institution, correct? Yes, so everybody will take the survey no matter what transfer first year, everybody will take the survey. And if we don't have enough there, it will prompt you to continue on to the exam. But it's all programmed the right way. You don't have to think too hard, just answer the questions. And if you need to do the exam, it'll prompt you to do so. Okay. And I think we still have maybe about 200 of our incoming students that still need to do that math placement. Yes. Is that the last number I heard? Yes. So I have some students that kind of say, oh, well, I took college algebra. I don't need to do this. You don't need the exam, but we do still need that survey. We collect it for everyone. Um, part of it is just so we can better service the next group of students. If we can kind of figure out what the trends are and what we should be offering, that way the following year we can offer the right number of seats for these classes. Um, so that's really, really helpful for us for planning, but it's also helpful for you so we can put you in the appropriate course this fall. Um, some students will also say, well, I'm a theater major. I don't need math. And that's very complicated answer, but the short version is if you haven't finished general education, you do still need math. And if you ever decide you might want to change your major or add a minor or somehow change your program, and that new program requires math, we need some sort of baseline for where we should start you. So I'm so glad that you did mention general education because next week's webinar is going to be with a few of our faculty and administration that work solely with our core program, which is Flagler's general education program. So we'll be able to do a huge deep dive into what that means, what students are taking, why Flagler's program is unique, um, and what the different pieces that make up that core puzzle look like for Flagler. Mm -hmm. So I will leave that to the core experts, but just know that your student will have support kind of navigating core the whole first year. That's our, that's our role is helping students transition to college in a general sense, but also specifically figuring out well, what are Flagler specific requirements? What do I need to complete here? What do I need to know about my first couple of years? So we'll help them navigate core uh, semester by semester as well. And the math survey that you're talking about, is there questions in there for all classes and their major, or is that a separate preference survey? Good question. So one student submit the math survey, all of those submissions are graded by a real human person. Um, sometimes we'll have students say, well, I submitted it last night at midnight. I'm sure you did, but Dr. Grant was not awake at midnight. So all of these submissions are graded by Dr. Carrie Grant. She is the department chair for our mathematics and technology department. She usually gives us results about once a week. Once your results have been entered into the admissions system, you will get a follow-up survey that asks for your preferences. Uh, and I should clarify, this survey goes to first year students only. Transfer students, there's less transfer students. So we typically have a one-on-one -on -one meeting because we have the capacity to do that. First year students, there's lots of you. So we use this survey method instead to collect, are you a morning person? Do you like spaces between your classes? Are you considering a minor? If you're an athlete, what does that practice schedule look like? So even though we will ultimately be building schedules for first year students, we are very much soliciting what are your preferences and what are the things that you're looking for in that schedule. So let's dive a little bit more into that. Why does CASE develop those schedules for first year students? I think we get asked this a lot. Yes, we've done this both ways. Um, initially, we had students build their own schedules 
And the feedback we were getting is that navigating a new system for actually going in and selecting courses, navigating new requirements, navigating the academic catalog, all of that is a little bit overwhelming the first time. So what we decided to do is collect those preferences on kind of what you were hoping to see, but then also use our expertise on what we know you actually need and what's going to keep you on track for your program. And we combine those two things and build the schedule on your behalf. So it's really just taking stress out of the process. Um, and the main question we typically get once students receive that schedule is I just wanna make sure these are classes that I need. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna assure everybody that is exactly why we are the ones building it. We are making sure every single class is meeting a requirement and that if there is anything you must take your first semester, that it's on your schedule. Great example of that is first year seminar uh, for our first year students. And I believe they'll probably be talking a little bit more about that mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. another Next webinar. Week. Yeah. Um, and so Kendra, as a transfer student, that was a little bit of a different process. So do you and Sarah wanna take us through what was that process like for building that first schedule as a transfer student? Yeah, so whenever I was coming in, once I completed the math placement survey saying that I had college credits coming in for math, then one of the other advisors in the case office, Jill Dawson, came, uh, gave me an email and we chatted on Zoom to talk about my preferences, what major I was going into, if I, because I was extended an invitation for the honors program, accept that invitation, just different things like that. So that is how my survey happened. It was much more of a face-to-face -face conversation just because I was coming in as a transfer student. Um, and I think a lot of questions that students want to know is, you know, what is a normal schedule going to look like? Are these normal classes? Are, am I taking classes that I will need? And so how do you navigate those conversations? Sure. So we pride ourselves on making this as personal of an experience as possible. So someone that is a first year student, but they're coming in with an associate's degree, it's going to have a very different schedule than someone that's truly starting fresh, has never taken a college course in their life. Even though those are both technically first year students, they might even be in the same major, wildly different paths and you know trajectories moving forward. And so we want to acknowledge that. And that is where we work with students individually to make sure that they have everything they need. If we're talking super traditional, never taken a college class, I'm a first year student, a uh, very typical first year schedule is going to be some sort of math, whether it is something towards your major, something towards the general education math. That is one of those skills that we can lose pretty quickly if we take too long of a gap. So we like to have students dive right into math and kind of take math until they're finished with that kind of category. If you're a math major, saddle up. You're going to be taking math for four years. Um, and then English, similar, you know, we feel like academic writing is such a foundational component of all of the other college coursework you're going to take, that taking academic writing first semester is huge to help you prepare. Um, so for some students, that will be English 142, which is a preparatory course. For some students, that will be the core academic writing, which again, they'll talk more about this next week. Either way, we're getting you in something where you're learning those skills, you're practicing your writing, and you're supported by an English composition instructor. Uh, third is going to be first year seminar. And this is a class that every first year student takes. Um, I teach this class and my very brief description is it's about one third welcome to college, one third welcome to Flagler and St. Augustine, and one third welcome to college level academics. Um, welcome to college and welcome to the college level academics are different. They'll talk about that next week. Um, oh, explain it. <laughs> so, and you've taught this, you know, yeah. so you describe it differently, but um, that's my, my elevator pitch for that. And then, so that's three classes. Students normally have five classes on their schedule. So for those last two spots, we're typically doing one class for the major, at least. Students are welcome to request more than one, but typically one. And then that fifth spot we're using for just one additional general education requirement. Um, and again, if you came in with a ton of college credits, you might not have any general education left. And that way we would just go straight into all of your major requirements instead. 
And so when I apply to Flagler, I am thinking I'm going to change the world as a psychology major. And then I go on an amazing trip over the summer and I'm thinking, nope, I'm going to change the world through coastal environmental science. Yes. And so I want to change my major. And I know that that is a very common thing. Like very. how do we navigate <laughs> those conversations? Yes. So on your way in, it is super easy. You haven't even gotten here yet. There's, there's no <laughs> Wow. You know, nothing's happened. So if you applied one thing, but you're interested in another, it is very easy to switch. You can email admissions, you can email case, you can email your case advisor directly. Really anybody you have a hold of at this point, let one of us know and we will connect with each other to make sure it's updated in all of our systems. And then if you, you know, let's talk about maybe one semester in, you've done one semester of psychology coursework, you take psych 101, and you go, mm, I don't think this is exactly what I thought it would be. I think I would like to try out coastal environmental science. That is okay. That's exactly what the case advisor is for. We can help map out, okay, if we are changing and we've got, let's say, three and a half years left, how do we map that out? What does that look like for you? Um, so we can help students build academic plans, and we're actually working on uh, collaborating with first-year seminars. So this is more of kind of an assignment that every student will do. The goal is to have every single student leave their first semester or their first academic year with a four year academic plan. So no one has any guesses about what's coming up. They have a solid roadmap of these are my requirements. This is kind of the order in which I'm going to take them. This is when I'm thinking I'm going to graduate. And if that major changes, then they can come chat with you, chat with the faculty advisor on creating that next roadmap and exactly. what that looks like and the exactly. different changes. Mm -hmm. um, how many credits do students typically take their first semester? First semester schedule is very typically 15 credit hours. That is typically our minimum. The reason it is our minimum is because students need a total of 120 credit hours to graduate. If you divide that into four years or eight semesters, it's 15 credit hours per semester. So if a student wants to graduate in four years, which most do, that's 15 credits per semester. And if someone's thinking, I don't know what credit hours are, it's okay. Just think about five classes is average. I'll never forget at my own orientation, my dad was like, you could totally handle six, seven classes. It's what you did in high school. And I was oh, like, dad, it's no. not you taking the classes. <laughs> I hope you did not take his advice. And that's a <laughs> side note. Um, students are eligible to take up to 19 credit hours for the same cost of tuition. Um, I would recommend if, you, if you're really eager and you want to do that, I would recommend maybe second semester and beyond. That Figure things out semester. first. See what, yeah, what it's like. Yeah, so much about transition and just feeling things out and finding your people and finding your places um, that we can't force you not to, but we really recommend just sticking with about 15 credit hours at first yeah. semester. Um, now, Kendra, we don't have any virtual sessions that will specifically be speaking to honors program or anything like that, but what were some of the additional requirements that you may have had as a participant in the honors program that might have added credits or experiences? So for the honors program, each semester you are required to take a one hour credit course that is normally meets, what, normally meets once a week normally on Fridays, just to go over to make sure you're hitting the milestones that their honors program requires. On top of this one credit hour course each semester, they also have something called a high, a high impact. So that is something like an internship that you do to get credit for, and then an upper division level course, which is something that is taking a 300 or 400 level class in either your major or your minor and making it harder somehow. So writing an extra paper, presenting a lesson to the class, something like that. And then in addition to all of that, you have your honors capstone, which is an additional capstone project or just a big overarching thing that you do that correlates with whatever your major is. So I did an extra poster and a whole extra research thing for a whole extra research project for mine. But some people in like tourism and hospitality and tourism, they're putting on a big event for the school. Project. So there are different things that capstones can look like for the honors mm -hmm. program. Okay. Um, 
So lots of conversations, lots of communication that's been happening to help build this schedule between the student and our case office. How do they actually like get their schedule? What does that process then look like? Yeah, so we have uh, a release schedule, I guess you would call it, advertised in emails and as well as on the admitted student page of the Flagler website. Um, we realized a while ago that making and releasing schedules every single day, all day, made us not as productive as we wanted to be. It was hard to focus on bigger projects. And it also didn't give students a good idea of when to estimate their schedule. You know, it would just pop up on a random Tuesday and they go, oh, is, is this my schedule? So we said, let's make this a little more methodical. Let's give ourselves more breathing room and let's let the students know from the very beginning, this is when you're going to get your schedule. So what we've decided to do basically, if students complete their deposit, their enrollment forms and their map placement by a certain date, they are then given their schedule on a certain date. Um, and when I say given their schedule, they receive an email from their case advisor, kind of walks them through, this is how to access it. This is what it's probably going to look like. This is how to book an appointment with me. And then we also include a note that says, if you like it, great. There's no need to do anything. Enjoy the rest of your week. So students don't ever need to feel obligated to schedule a meeting. We would love to talk to you. We would love to get to know you. But if you look at that schedule and you say, this looks awesome, great. Then you can just leave it as is. You are already registered. Um, I think that's part of a confusion point too. People think that we're like pre-registering them or halfway registering them, but I promise whatever schedule you get, you are fully registered. There's nothing else you need to do unless you do want to make or anything right. like that. And there, um, and again, the full schedule release timeline is on the website and it's in various emails that you receive. Uh, but I'm going to run through it super quickly. Students that did everything they needed to by May 1st, they already received their schedule on June 3rd. Uh, everybody that did everything by June 1st is going to receive their schedule this upcoming Monday, June 24th. People that finish their math placement and such by July 1st will receive a schedule July 22nd. If they finish by August 1st, they receive a schedule August 12th. And if they finish anytime after August 1st, they'll receive their schedule by August 19th. And just to clarify, if somebody's like, I don't really want to take math, so I'm not going to do this. They won't get their schedule. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that is a required component. Um, and I think people get worried because they, some people will say, well, I'm not very good at math. You know, I don't, I don't want to submit it, but I want to be very clear. This has absolutely no bearing on your admissions decision. Never, ever have we gotten a math placement and gone, woof, we're going to rescind their offer. This is <laughs> never, that's not what the point of it is. It is just so we do not throw you into a math class that is too difficult or that we don't put you in a math class that is not challenging enough for you. We want it to be that. Or that's going to benefit you later on. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so I know students love to look at their schedules and then we've got family members that are like, let's have a conversation. What did they put you in? What does this mean? Yes. Um, and all of a sudden, then we want to make some changes. So yes. what does that process and request look like? So we are required to meet with first year students to do this together. Um, and again, after the first semester, after doing this this first time, students are going to have a lot more freedom to build their own schedule. It's going to remain unlocked so they can make changes. But this first time around, we kind of lock it down so that students are forced to have a conversation with us. And that sounds kind of mean, kind of harsh, but it's really just so we can work together. We can become partners. Everybody's on the same page. Yeah, get everybody on the same page. Um, because I cannot tell you how many times before we would lock it down and it'd be open all summer. I'd have so many emails. Oops, I accidentally dropped this class. Now it's full. Can you get me back in? I'm like, oh, no, I, I can't. I'm sorry. Somebody else was waiting to click it. <laughs> right. And so sometimes it's just like an accidental mistake or they drop something like first year seminar that you're like, what's this? Never heard of it. And they drop it, but it's required. So that's why you can absolutely reach out to us. We can totally tell you what else is available. We can make some tweaks, but we're going to do it together. So you would either email your advisor, but honestly, the easiest way is to Google meet your case advisor, Flagler. I think the very first link is going to take you to our team page. And that's where all of our bookings links are. 
Bookings is the platform we use to schedule meetings. It's Microsoft platform. So again, you don't have to be a current student. Anybody can make an appointment, um, but that is the easiest way to make sure you're gonna get a hold of us and you can choose Zoom, phone, in-person. Um, and we're currently at a point for our new incoming students that families are welcome to join the call. We really encourage students to take the lead, but families are welcome to be part of that call. Uh, once students start classes in August, there is a new layer of uh, kind of privacy that comes into play. It's called FERPA. I'm not going to spell out the whole acronym for you, but it's basically educational privacy rights for your student. What that means is unless they give someone explicit permission, I am not allowed to discuss any part of their academic record with anybody but the student. So again, during the summer before they get here, we're in this gray area where it's okay, but starting day one of classes, we would need one of those FERPA releases or FERPA waivers, which you can find in the office of the registrar. So hopefully this is really allowing our families and students to understand what that summer process looks like. Like, I feel like we have thrown the curtain away. We have taken everybody into like the green room behind stage on what this whole theater of academic advising and registration looks like before our students get here. Kendra, can you take us through, you know, just a really quick little insight into what it looks like registering for that second semester so that we can see how it's a little bit different? Yeah. So for registering for your second semester, you will get an email saying that classes are now available for you to look at so you can see what all is being offered in the spring semester. And in that email, it'll say, you need to be cleared with your case advisor. This will not change. It'll change that you won't be getting cleared with a case advisor. You'll be getting cleared with faculty advisor as you continue on at Flagler, but you have to get cleared with an advisor before you can register. So that is number one, what I personally look for and do is go, okay, this is the date that I register. This is the time. Now let's go look at these classes, figure out, okay, so I need this class, this class, this class. Come up to uh, um, the meetings with the advisors with draft schedules saying, hey, I know I need this. I want to take this, different things like that. And then once you meet with your advisor and they tell you, okay, you're cleared, then you just wait until it is your registration date and time. And at that point in time, you get to, you will log on to my Flagler, which is something you'll come become very familiar with throughout your time at Flagler. And you will register on it there. I personally recommend still coming to the library, case advisors are there to help first year students, or even if you're not a first year student and something's not making sense and you're like, I swear I had the prerequisites for this class, but sometimes course code change or something, or there's just a little glitch, then it's still nice to be in the library and be able to ask someone for help that will know what is, go that will know what is going on. Then, so once you get there early, I recommend looking at what classes you really want first and seeing how many spots are available. If there is a class that you really, really want that only has two spots left, then you know you want to click register for that before you register for anything else. And so just making sure you get those classes that you really want that would, is the best way for that. But other than that, that's pretty much what registration will look like for the next seven semesters after your first one. All right. Any other recommendations that you'd like to share with our audience about the process before they arrive or after they arrive? Uh, if that's direct, I didn't know if that was for Kendra or me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's to everybody. Okay. So I would just say get very, very used to students checking their email. There's, there's not really another good way to get a hold of everybody quickly at the same time. So pretty much every important piece of information is going to your email, specifically Flagler College email account. So if currently that email account is really just used to gather shopping coupons and advertisements, 
let's get into gear and, and get in the habit of checking your email daily. Um, I always use the same kind of, I don't want to call it a horror story because it's, it's all fine, but just a, a cautionary tale. Um, <laughs> we always tell students, please check your email daily. Once daily is totally enough. And I had a student who accidentally slept through their final exam for accounting. And the professor very kindly reached out and said, hey, I noticed you weren't here. I hope you're feeling okay. Uh, please respond so we can set a makeup time. The student never checked their email. They never replied. So they got a big zero for their final exam when the professor was really kind to reach out and offer another opportunity to take it. So it's just like, you know, that was an accident. Nobody meant to sleep through their exam, but if he would have just checked his email, he could have taken it and it would have been fine. So those are the sorts of things that might miss if you're not checking it regularly. Um, so getting in that habit over the summer is super important. I think my other piece of advice is if you are very used to, and now I'm talking, as a parent, I'm allowed to talk to the parents now. Um, you might be used to kind of taking the lead in these conversations with your students. It is an excellent time to take a back seat, let the student be a self-advocate, let the student explore some questions they have figure some things out for themselves because they are going to college without you, which I know is sad. <laughs> you will visit, they will visit, it'll be fine. But helping them in the meantime, get used to taking the lead helps them so much once they're here because they're used to asking questions. They're used to asking for help and it's not as big as a, of a deal anymore. And they know kind of who to go to with certain questions by that point. Uh, absolutely. I just definitely think getting to know your advisors, again, getting to know the people who are teaching your classes, your professors, that is something that has been, that I found really, really helpful at my time at Flagler and still continuing on. I use professors, job references, and different things like have them write letters of recommendation for grad school. So it's just really important to build the connections around you with people who are already in your field that you really want to be in. So. If anybody is looking to contact the case office, what's the best way to reach out? We have, um, again, those bookings links are available on the Flagler website. Uh, our email is C-A-C-E case at flagler.edu. And we do have a phone number. It's new. So I've already forgotten what it is. We used to only have individual phone numbers, but um, we just added kind of a main line, which is really helpful. And it is 904-826-8504. Again, all of that is on the website, so you don't need to memorize that, but phone, email. And then we're on the third floor of the Proctor Library. So once the fall semester starts and campus is a little more active and the library is more open, um, that's where you'll find us. And then just looking at some of our Q&A before we wrap up with some important reminders, um, how does a student know who their case advisor is, or is it just kind of like a free-for-all? No, not a free-for-all. Um, but the main way to find out is, again, I hate to keep referring to the Meet Your Case Advisor website page, but that does list exactly who we are assigned to. Um, so for me, for example, I'm kind of the only outlier in that I work with all athletes regardless of their major. If you're a student athlete, you're with me. For all of our other case advisors, they are specifically assigned based on the student's major. Someone's a theater major, they're with Samuel Sani. Someone's a psych major, they're with Wendell McGahee. On and on and on. So those assignments are listed on the webpage or there have definitely been emails going out that tell you either who your case advisor is, or it has been an email directly from your case advisor and you can just reply to them. If you're still unsure, which is totally fine because there's a lot of information coming at you right now and you might've just missed it, you can just email that case at flagler.edu account and we're more than happy to let you know who your advisor is. Um, and so I know we've been sharing a lot of different links and phone numbers and stuff like that. Um, as a reminder, we will record all of these and then we're hoping to get them up into the family portal, get them into student newsletters, checking in with our MarCom team on whether we want to have like a little hub on our website. 
um, but we will definitely follow up with all of the participants today to also send out some of this contact information for you all. Um, Kendra, we do have one other question. If you know about some of the requirements for the honors program um, and maybe some of the other activities, but we can also connect this individual with the honors program specifically if we need to. <laughs> Absolutely. So besides those academic requirements that I talked about earlier. If you could go over those yeah, again, just can. really quickly, that For would sure. be helpful. So each semester you will be taking a one credit hour course, depending on what semester you are. So your first year seminar class, I believe is still mixed or is that with honors specifically? Honor. I didn't take that as an honors one. So yeah, Kendra was a transfer first, student, so yeah. she skipped over honors 100, which is basically the honors equivalent yeah. of that first year seminar class. Yes, and then the next semester you'll be in a learning community, which is a very similar, it is a similar class to di learning different things. They'll ha they have different themes each for diff the different honor, for the le different learning communities, so sorry, <laughs> um, that they will be offering in the spring. So that will be something to look forward to. And they will be able to talk about that at the all program meetings. So every semester we have at least one all program meeting. It says everyone from the honors program comes and we talk about what's happening. This, what's happening each semester. You, we also have a honors program canvas page that's where announcements go out to everyone in the honors program about the different activities that are following. But I'll talk more about activities in a second. Then afterwards, you will be put in honors 200 and 201. So for honors 200, you will read a book or most people read a book. If you're an art major, it can be slightly different. I'm not exactly sure, but I know they talked about um, different analyzing different paintings and different works of art. Yeah, yeah. But you focus on something that is in your major that is considered a great work. And you are assigned a mentor that is a professor in your major. And you meet with that mentor at least three times during the semester to discuss whatever work you are looking at. Then in Honors 201, you write a paper and give a presentation to your class on why this is a great work. Then moving into Honors 300 and 301, well, mainly honors 300, that's called your prospectus year or semester. Prospectus is formulating what you want to do for your capstone and coming up with these research outlines and what you want to do and assigning your committee. For the honors program for your capstone, you will have a reader who is someone who will read over what you write or just kind of a secondary person, but you'll have a mentor that is a main staff person in your field that will help you and lead you through your project. That will be your direct point of contact and the person you work closely with in your in whatever your project is. And then your reader can be as involved as you need them to be, but they're like your secondary mentor, sort of. And so then your second semester of your junior year and your first semester of your senior year. So your sixth and seventh semester, you will be working on your capstone. And then your final semester, you will be presenting your capstone at your capstone defense, which isn't as scary as it sounds, but that is when your so one of the directors from the honors program, there are three different, there are four different directors, and they they are assigned to you and your mentor and your reader all come together and watch you present something that you've just worked the past two years on. It's so rewarding to do it. It's great. Again, it's not as scary as it seems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that is what the coursework is. And then for the activities, as I said, we have an honors SGA that puts on different fun social events. This past semester, we had a formal for the first time ever. We do a field day every spring and we do a brain bowl, which is kind of like a Jeopardy compet competition every fall semester. Those are super fun, love participating in them. If you want more information about the different activities that we have done, we have an Instagram page that I highly encourage you follow. And it is FC Honors that is 
as FC Honors, yeah. That is our Instagram page. Definitely check it out. See all the fun things that we've done in the past. And we have an awesome SGA who is taking over to this next year. And I'll plan lots of fun. That's great. Sarah, if we have any incoming students that are interested in the honors program, do you know how they can get connected with it, what that looks like? Yes. So if they are new, I highly recommend reaching out to Emily King in the admissions office. She is our kind of honors program liaison between those new students and the director of the honors program, who's Dr. Wes King. Um, so she will kind of present the student to Dr. King and say, hey, this student I think would be a good candidate. Wes will, you know, work with her. And then if they invite the student to the honors program, the student then has the choice to accept. Um, I am not sure at this point how many seats are available, but I have not gotten the email that, hey, we're all full up, no more honors. So I would imagine there's still at least, you know, a handful of seats left in the spot. program. Mm -hmm. Okay. And students can join after their first year or is it only coming in as a first year? Yeah. So if you come in first year, you're accepting that invite from the admissions folks but there's also a way to be nominated by your faculty. So maybe you didn't get that invite from admissions the first time around, that's okay. If you have a really stellar first semester, there's going to be an email that goes out over winter break from Wes King that says, hey, we're looking for nominations for our honors program. And that's when faculty are able to submit those nominations for just those students that really stood out and um, they feel like they'd be a good fit for the honors program. Um, so I've had some of my advisees get into the program that way as well okay and you uh, can oh sorry you can no, even get in later than your first year as well okay it's not something so if you decide later on that you might be interested yeah talk to your advisors about nominating them yes okay. um well with last week we felt this was pretty helpful to go over some important dates just to mark some calendars and things like that um just to keep everybody kind of in the loop, June 15th is when bills were made available to our students. So those can be accessed in my Flagler and we encourage students to reach out to financial aid or student accounts with any specific questions regarding that. Um, welcome week occurs right after students move in. And that's like our big celebration on campus where students get acclimated. And we have a couple different events geared towards case and and things like that so on august 25th they have their first year advising sessions sarah do you know what that schedule looks like or what that's made up of yeah there's sunday morning we've got some geared towards first year students one that's specifically for transfer students and it's kind of just we had been giving you big picture information before now we're giving you very specific this is where you go for tutoring this is how you find your professor's office hours um, this is what the ad drop period is. So we're kind of looking more granular and more short term for the things we feel like you're going to need in the next few weeks to be successful and get off to a good start. And are those required during welcome week? Yes, they are mandatory. Um, it is, it is possible to make those up if somebody is sick, if they have a job, they just cannot get out of work that day. Um, they can schedule an appointment with their case advisor and we can just give them kind of a one-on-one -on -one instead. But because there are 800 of you, it'd be super helpful if you could just come to the big group sessions. We can kind of get all of you in one room together. Um, but again, if something happens, we can totally give you the information. Um, we also use a PowerPoint, so we can email you the PowerPoint, however you want to get that information. But the session is mandatory, and it's listed as mandatory on Saints Connect, which is our okay. event platform. And they'll find out the location for those and where they have to be. Yes. Yep. And I believe um, we were told by Student Life that everybody will be receiving um, information on how to access our event platform, which again is called Saints Connect. Yeah. And so any Welcome Week event will be in there with times, locations, dates. And then if you click on it, it typically gives you a description. Um, you can register ahead of time so that you're notified and you get reminders if something's coming up. Um, so I believe most of our Welcome Week events are going to be on. Yes. Okay. And then continuing with Welcome Week, we have an academic session that will be with their first year seminar. So we'll go over that a little bit more next week with that panel. Um, and then there are major meetups, which is something new that we're adding. So are you able to speak a little bit to those? 
Yeah, we actually did these a few years ago and I don't, I think COVID kind of made them disperse for a little bit, but they're just a way for students to get to meet their other students in their major, first of all, so their peers, but also the faculty members in their major right away. So you can make those connections and put names to faces and make connections with those instructors so that you can get some of those kind of more basic questions out of the way, but you're also just making connections from day one. Um, so if you are you know, unsure about your major, great place to ask questions. If you've been dreaming about this field since you were six years old, great place to ask questions. So it can kind of cover a whole spectrum of things depending on where you're at in your decision process. But at the very least, you're meeting other students your age that are also interested in that field. So yes. I mean, I remember time. seeing students that were like, but I'm a double major. Which one do I pick? And it's like, yeah. you can just pick whichever one you want because right. it's, the goal is to meet students and meet faculty and yep. you'll meet the other students and the other faculty members through other avenues. And they're pretty casual. So, you know, let's say I can't remember how long they are, but let's say they're an hour long. You can spend 30 minutes at one and 30 minutes at another. Um, our campus is not very large if you've been here, so it's pretty easy to pop back and forth between sections. So I don't anticipate it being a sit down presentation. I think it's more of just mingling and meeting people and there's probably snacks and, you know, drinks and stuff like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, We're on the hook for snacks now. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but we know how students get excited about snacks. I mean, employees do as well. Yes. Um, and so August 25th is first year advising sessions. August 26th is those academic sessions and then the major meetups. And then because of the um, meeting with case to discuss changes and stuff like that, a good reminder is September 3rd is our ad drop deadline for the fall semester. So that is when students can make changes to their schedule. Mm -hmm. um, that deadline right after that, they won't be able to make any of those changes, but definitely mm -hmm. connecting with the case advisor. Um, we had one more question come in about the honors program, but I think I'd like to direct um, any more honors program questions directly to our honors program. And so I'm assuming wking at flagler.edu is that the best contact? Or Emily King in admissions. And funny enough, no relation. They're just <laughs> both has the last name King. Um, but Emily King or Wes King can both answer questions, especially okay. especially for our new students about the yeah. Honors. Um, and then any just general questions, you can always email orientation at flagler.edu, and we'd be happy to kind of filter out those questions to the appropriate offices. Um, again, our next webinar is going to be June 27th at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we'll be going over core first year seminar and the common read. Um, we'll be sure to follow up with all of our attendees today on that contact information for our case office with your brand new phone number um, so people can be calling you. And then don't forget, we do have our Roar Up Summer Sessions, and this is a fantastic way for our students and families to connect to the institution, taking that deeper look into what campus will be like and what life will be like here at Flagler. Um, it's an exciting time over the summer with all of our construction. I think every college campus likes to do lots of construction over the summer, so it doesn't impede on everybody as much during the academic year, but it's exciting to see what's happening. I know I hung out there last week and watched all the construction, like a little kid watching the tractors and everything. Um, but thank you both Sarah and Kendra for joining us. Thank you so much to our families for joining us. We really appreciate it. If you've got any other questions for us, please be sure to send them to orientation at flagler.edu and we'll definitely be able to answer those for you. So thank you all and we look forward to seeing you next week.